Lee, thank you so much for being on the show. Can we start with a big question? What is free speech? Um, free speech is the, the freedom, the, uh, uh, the, lack, the, the absence of sanctions for people to s express themselves. Does that, That's it. Does that mean the sanctions of one's peers and one's friends as well, or just the sanctions uh, from this, government? It, it, it's, to me, it's all of it. I mean, they are not the same sanctions from the government and sanctions from one's peers or coworkers or bosses or whatever, but they're all. All of those play into the uh, people's ability to speak and express themselves freely. How does that relate to consequences for a person's speech? Because I think part of what we're going through at the moment is uh, a battle between people who want to see greater or harsher consequences against speech that is intolerable and those who have, a, I suppose, a more boisterous view about what should be able to be said. So if I, if I say that Jews are inferior or that women are no good at science, uh, that, you know, there, a lot of people will take offense at that and they will sanction me in certain social ways. I'll be exclu I might not be invited to, to cocktail parties and so on. Is that appropriate or inappropriate? What about my free speech? Well, appropriate and inappropriate. I mean, you're, you, you started with what is it? Now, sort of a different question is what are the appropriate limits to free speech? And exactly as your question implies, uh, there is a, I don't know, a, a, certainly in the states, possibly across the democratic West, um, this is a hot topic of conversation where uh, people are trying to renegotiate in some sense what constitutes um, appropriate limits and boundaries on free speech. There are people who say they're absolutists. I don't really believe them. Like I think they haven't thought it through. I don't think anybody can be an absolutist because even absolutists, I, I think, would you know stop at you know someone holding a gun or an axe to your head, saying, "Give me your money, or I'm gonna you know I'm gonna blow your head off." Like I don't. I, I, maybe there are people who think that's okay, but 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 not very many. And so so once you accept that, you're accepting there are some limits to speech, and then the question is, under what conditions and when. Well, let's answer that question. What's your opinion on that? <laughs> what are the appropriate limits to, to free speech? <laughs> Thinking specifically, I suppose, about the denigration of minorities, which is the one that, that yeah, is yeah. coming up at the moment in the, in, in, at this cultural time. Well, so there are different, like there's a moral perspective and a legal perspective and they're, they're different. Um, and so, and it's often good to start from one and then move into the other. So from a legal perspective, in the, at least in the States, I, you know, hate speech is completely legal. Right? I mean, there's just no prohibition anywhere against hate speech. Uh, so that's from a legal standpoint. But at the same time, what that means is there is no prohibition against denouncing those who use hate speech. And this goes on and on in that, well, okay, if hate speech is legal, then anything short of hate speech is legal. And, but denouncing anything short of hate speech is also legal. So there's denouncing, right? So there's denouncing which may create social pressure for people to maybe walk back or not be so brazen in how they express themselves. Um, but that's still, you know, it's curtailing free speech, whether it's a different question, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not good. That's, each case is so different you, in my opinion, you need to actually consider specific cases on their merits, whether it's a sort of good thing or a bad thing. So maybe, maybe I'll just stop there. Mm. I'm glad you used the word denunciation because you make a distinction in your work between criticism and denunciation. What is that distinction? Yeah. Oh, well, so you, uh, you or I or anybody may propose some idea. I mean, in my you know, regular life, it's an some academic presenting evidence that bears on some issue in a talk, might be a series of studies or a theory or something like that. But it doesn't have to be academics talking about science. It could be a political idea, a policy idea, 
um, um, it really could be anything. And so criticism is some version of, no, that's a bad idea, or no, you're saying this is true, but the basis on which you're saying this is true is so flawed, no one should believe that it's actually true. Or, or you're proposing a certain policy and you think if this is a net good, I, I believe this policy is horrendously immoral. And here's why I think it's immoral. So that's criticism. That's like, you know, it's a reasonably functional way for a group of people or a society to figure out which way it should go. Um, denunciation um, is, you know, is some version of anyone who promotes an idea such as yours is so revolting. Uh, what we should do is punish them to the fullest extent that we're able to do. And what that means is, uh, you know, who knows what it means, right? It could mean getting you fired from your job, right? That, that's not criticism. That is punishment. So there is now people absolutely from a, from a legal standpoint, people have every right to call for your job or to call for my job. That's from a legal standpoint. That's part of free speech. They have the right to say you should be fired. I should be fired. Or you will. Neither one of us should ever work in this town again. Like they have the right to say all those things. But typically for most of us, we're hired by somebody. Somebody is paying our salary. I mean, you know, unless we're independent entrepreneurs, that's different. Uh, but if you have a job, the punishment can actually only come from your employer, from whoever holds power. So regardless of what the mob says, it's really the person in power. Maybe it's my dean or my provost. Maybe it's your boss, you know, or the head of the company, the CEO of the company, or whoever it might be. Those are the people making the decisions to inflict the punishment. The mob, they may be doing it in response to a mob. The mob cannot get you or me fired unless they win the relevant authority over to their side. So I distinguish between all of those. But the mob has the right to call for your or my head, and they have the right to call for your head or my head for what you or I might think are the stupidest reasons. <laughs> they have the, the mob has the right to demand that I get fired because I'm wearing a brown cap. At this, at this uh, podcast, at this, this interview, I was going to say I, I, I was going to say something, but I thought I'd just write a sternly worded letter to your boss <laughs> after the interview. Uh, <laughs> is the mob getting more powerful, and are bosses giving into it more? That's a great question. I, I think so. I think the answers to that are yes, and I think the main reason the answers to that are yes is because social media has made two things much more easy but, uh, for to come into the public eye. So, so that's, that's one part of it. And the other part is social media has made it easier for denunci denunciation mobs to form. So um, because of social media, if someone, you know, the, the range of things that people get sanctioned for regarding speech and oppression and expression range from, in my opinion, range from nothing at all. Things that are just like completely legitimate. Like somebody is an academic opposing affirmative action or opposing diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Like that should be a completely legitimate thing to discuss. I'm not saying I agree with those positions necessarily. You'd have to go into the specifics of the position to figure out, for me to figure out whether I agree with it. But it should be able to be discussed. This is not like espousing genocide or you know race superiority. It's, it's just it's not doing any of those things. Um, so, but so people have been denounced and called to sanctions and sometimes actually sanctioned for things that range from completely legitimate to minor faux pas. You know, there was a guy I think at the University of Michigan who showed, um, um, I think it was a version of Othello with, um, I think it was Sir Lawrence Olivier playing Othello in blackface. Now this is a 1960s movie. It was some theater create some, you know, relevant class. And, you know, this created a firestorm and he was removed. I believe he, the upshot was he was removed from teaching that class. Now that is at worst a faux pas. It's debatable whether that's even a faux pas, but, but at worst this, I mean, he didn't, he didn't use a racial slur. He wasn't unprofessional with his students. He showed a movie from the 1960s. So 
but we could call that, okay, kind of made a mistake, but, but he's sanctioned for that up until things that, well, you know, people um, have said things that are, you know, would by most people be considered deeply insulting and, and either are or bo- at least border on things like racial or ethnic, ethnic slurs, which really for the most part, well, th- again, there's a difference between use and reference. So again, this is a hot issue that seems to be resolved on the wrong side, in my opinion. And that is in academia, as in the case with the professor who showed an old movie with uh, um, an actor playing in blackface, um, you know, if you have a book or a source that now uses racial slurs or ethnic slurs or, or gender-based slurs, you can, you're routinely now sanctioned. I don't know if you're always sanctioned, but you're routinely sanctioned. Um, so, which means, uh, you know, if I was tempted to teach Huckleberry Finn, I would not be allowed to do that. I, I wouldn't do it because there are there's racial slur in there. Um, so, but, but up to and including the use of these sort of slurs. So pe- uh, people can and have been punished. So that, you know, I, I mean, that's the state of play. And, and, it, and so th- this happens in part because social media spreads this kind of stuff in a, you know, like a wildfire kind of way that was never the case before social media. So lots of people know about it, they hear about it, they see about it. and Social media makes it way easier for a mob to form, you know, and, and in the space of two days, you have a thousand people calling for somebody to be fired or suspended or punished in some way, which, again, you, that was very rare to have such rapidly developing outrage mobs 30 or 40 years mm. ago. So the technology is enabling a kind of a cultural upswell and then the cultural upswell reinforces the technology in the sense that everybody knows that these right. things happen. Like we're familiar right. with this script now, right? We're familiar with the right, the, right. the person in, a, in a, at, a, at a university or a college or a newspaper or a celebrity or someone on the Today Show or whatever it might be saying something that, right. uh, you know, they, they trigger a tripwire. And then we see the process unfold. It's almost like a, you know, you're right. watching the same movie over again. The, the Twitter mob comes for them. You know, the corporation right. or the university tries to figure out what to do about it. Right. They put on a suspension, right. you know, pending investigation. Who knows what the investigation is, you know. And then ultimately either the mob wins or it, or it doesn't win. Do you see this then right. as, as predominantly a technological phenomenon or predominantly a cultural phenomenon? Like, how should we think about this? And particularly, let's start talking about universities and colleges and where we're sort of getting our ideas from, because I suppose that's the most relevant place where we learn how to think. There, there is a, 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 a controversial social science issue, not hotly debated, but like in which the social science is unclear, is the extent to which universities, and I'm talking about American universities. I, I don't have enough knowledge about, you know, the Netherlands or Nigeria to have a serious opinion about what university life is like in any of those places, um, are hotbeds of political indoctrination. And certainly the faculty are way, way left. I mean, that's, and which, you know, I mean, I feel like it's gonna make me sound like Tucker Carlson or something like that, but just the data are overwhelming that the faculty are overwhelmingly left. And when I say overwhelmingly, I'm talking about the social sciences and humanities, it's less in physics and chemistry, but it's pretty skewed there also. We are talking 90, 95, 99% of people who will identify as, as on, the left of, you know, on the left of the American political spectrum. And it doesn't matter how this is done. It could be done with party identification, self-reported ideology, and so on. It's, it's you know, not, you know, 90 to 99% of people in anthropology, sociology, philosophy, are on the left and a substantial minority self-identify as, as far left, radicals, activists, Marxists, that, that kind of thing. So this is not some delusion of, you know, of, of right-wing ax grinders. That's literally, literally the state of the university it's here. It's not every university, but it's on average in general, that's what it's like. Okay, so, but that's a different question than whether they gave and an engage in indoctrination. And there were a series of studies over the last 20, 25 years or so um, that have found that it's even though it's unclear whether faculty 
try to indoctrinate students, evidence on that's kind of mixed, they basically fail. That students are not heavily influenced, or at least their political ideology is not heavily influenced by the ideology of the faculty. They are heavily influenced by the ideology of other students, but that's a sort of a peer group type effect and that, that sort of uh, yeah, teenagers and young adults being heavily affected by their peer groups, that's long established uh, common phenomenon. But paper just came out um, and I have to admit, I'm still digesting it, but it just came out finding that what you do get at universities is faculty, the experience at universities increases students' moral absolutism. So whichever side they're on, and you know, they skew left to start with, you're getting this this paper, it's only one paper, it only just came out, typically, you know, on general principles, most of these sort of new hot findings, in my opinion, need five to 10 years before anyone figures out what they really mean until other people try and look at the same thing. But, but this, you know, to the, if this holds, it suggests a way in which universities may be sort of um, exacerbated some of the polarization and political divides by leading 20 year olds, 21 year olds to be way more certain of the truth of their political beliefs than they have any right to be. You have a couple of hypotheses about radicalization in academia. Uh, what are they? Well, I, you know, to some extent, it's just very, very simple. The, there's a, going back forever, there's a very small minority of far left and far right people in any like national survey in the States. It's typically 10% more left are on the far left and far right. You know, any given survey might, might find 6% or 8% or 12%, but I ballpark it as around 10% on the fringes. Okay, fine. At 10%, it's, 10% can still do a lot of damage. You know, my understanding, for example, is the Bolsheviks never had more, more support than about 20% of the Russian population. So a highly organized small minority can do a lot of damage. I mean, you have small examples of that here. I mean, they think the Capitol riot was not typical of American Republicans, but it was a very bad thing. And I think the sustained violence that we had in the name of social justice in the places, places like Seattle and, and Portland was also a very bad thing. But again, I don't think that was, that certainly wasn't most of the social justice protests and it's not the most, most of the people who supported Black Lives Matter. Okay, so you don't, so, so the radical fringes can do a lot of damage on their own, but within academia, just remember, if academia is, we can ballpark it as entirely left. I mean, at the point that you're 90, 95, 98, 99%, it's like the other two or three or 5% hardly matter. So just ballparking it, you know, if it's all left, then just off the bat, you can double the fringe number. I mean, if the fringe number is 10 and academia is otherwise um, representative of the left, there should be about 20%. Now, once you get 20%, you're having a, you know, sort of almost a critical mass of, of, of activists, uh, you know, people, activists and extremists. But, it's, but the evidence is it's actually considerably higher, at least in the social sciences and humanities, it approaches 40%. And I suspect that what's going on there is a lot of self-selection. People learn that these fields, you know, uh, hold certain values it, far left values and worldviews. And if that appeals to you, it's like, oh, wow, here's a bunch of people who think just like I do. I want to go into you know, philosophy or anthropology or sociology or whatever it might be. So you have a powerful self-selection effect. And then you have a critical mask. This then produces scholarship that seems to vindicate a sort of far left worldview. And then whether it's other scholars or mass media or anybody else can then point to the scholarship as vindicating this worldview um, when in fact it has elements of a Ponzi scheme. That self-selection hypothesis, Lee, that, that, that you know, 
uh, academia starts out being a little bit more left-wing, therefore more left-wing people are attracted to it, they feel comfortable around their peers, they feel comfortable around the sorts of ideas that are being discussed, so it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Something just doesn't quite smell right about the sort of arbitrariness uh, of that, about the idea that if you you roll the dice on history, it could easily have gone the other way, and you might have uh, academic institutions that are overwhelmingly conservative. Uh, it's It right. reminds me a little bit of the question about why isn't there as much good right-wing comedy as there is left-wing <laughs> subversive comedy. You know, people often ask this, and the simple answer is, I don't really know, but I don't think it's an accident. Uh, and I wonder whether or not there's something about the the left that is, what, more curious, more interested in the kinds of things that yeah. social scientists talk about, more willing to subvert dominant power structures and to ask critical questions and things like that. Like, what else is going, what else could be going on that could explain the paucity of sure. conservatives yeah, yeah. in social sciences? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, all of that is completely fa fair, and there's, it pro is probably true to some degree, and the degree to which is currently not completely clear. Um, so I'm hesitating because I have reservations about the work, but some work shows, for example, that uh, people on the left are more, score higher on the personality dimensions. There's no politics involved, hypothetically. Um, openness to experience. And so the idea is that people who are more open to experience are more intellectually curious and more likely to be drawn into you know, fields that promote the life of the mind, like academia or science or social science. So there, there may well be some, so I have reservations about that because sometimes I suspect that perhaps unintentionally politics are embedded in some of those measures. So in some versions of the openness to experience questionnaire, um, one question goes something like, I like to spend time you know, visiting uh, 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 art museums or something like that. Some, I like to visit the museums and exhibits or concerts or museums. Okay, so what does that have to do with politics? Well, in the States it does, because in the States, the, the uh, sort of Democrat Republican, um, a huge demarker of a Republican and conservative is whether you are, uh, um, uh, whether you live in a rural or an urban area. So the American cities are overwhelmingly Democratic. Even when they're in heavily Republican states, the cities are overwhelmingly Democratic. The rural areas, even in very democratic states, are overwhelmingly Republican. Now, none of this is absolute always, but it's like uh, really a lot. Now, if you live out on the farm, you don't have lots of opportunities to go to museums. <laughs> they need to ask about your, right. your openness to NASCAR and the Crawfish right, yeah, Museum right. down on the right. bayou. Right. Right. So that's my reservation with the measure. But, but let's put my reservations aside and say, okay, we can just take it at face value. The uh, uh, liberals, people on the left, actually are on average more open to experience than our conservatives. Those differences are still not gigantic. They're small to moderate. And they, they, might, they might play to some degree into differential self-selection into fields like academia or science. But those differences are so small I, they can't possibly explain a skew of like 95% to, you know, 3% apolitical and 2% conservative. It can't possibly explain a skew of 20 or 30 to 1. It just, it, it can't do that work. Okay, so let's uh, let's assume that that maybe those factors of openness and curiosity give the left uh, an initial leg up in uh, the humanities at universities, yeah. and there and thereafter uh, your phenomenon of of self selection comes into play, and it becomes a snowballing a snowballing effect where yeah. a conservative yeah. would just feel so alienated and would just find the ideas to be so uh, closed minded or repugnant that they don't want to go into that into that field in the first place. Yeah, now, you know, what's not clear, though, is if you go back far enough, you know, there's, there's some data going back 100 years on the political skew of academia. So, and you would think, then, that if the, it, it, 
you know, if there's something about people who happen to be on the left that differentiates them from people who happen to be on the right that would somehow make academia more appealing to people on the left, you should have a big split 100 years ago. And the, you don't have that sort of big split 100 years ago. So it kind of, you know, we don't really know also the measures of left right that are available from 100 years ago are probably not as good as they are now. So let's just talk um, about the consequence of this though Lee as well because one thing that you say that I think is interesting is that that, that this imbalance in academic institutions means that there is a bias towards the way that particular ideas sound or can be labeled in the sense that if something is perceived or can couch itself in the garb of social justice or issues that are dear to the left's heart, yeah. then it receives less scrutiny. And if something can be tarred or tarnished with the label of being in opposition to social justice, it will be pilloried regardless of the, the credibility of the, of the ideas therein. Can you elaborate on that? How does that work? Well, I mean, it works. I mean, it works in all sorts of ways. So, one of my favorite—I mean, I was just listening to a podcast. There's a um, a book that just just came out called *The Genetic Lottery* uh, by uh, Paige Harden, and uh, she's a you know a psychological geneticist. You know, studies heritability and intelligence and all sorts of other traits. And and uh, uh, in the book, she argues that people in general, but the left and particularly and academia in particular, really needs to take the, seriously the fact that all sorts of like really valued and important life outcomes um, have a genetic component. Doesn't mean they're only determined by genetics, doesn't mean other things don't matter. And she kind of frames it as the genetic lottery because she positions, she explicitly positions herself and the demeanor of the book on the left. That is, you know, winners of the genetic lottery, you know, you can view that as sort of, in some sense, the ultimate form of privilege. Because of course, you didn't choose your genes. Yeah, I didn't choose my genes. And so it is the sort of the height of an unearned advantage. Now, um, she was on Jesse Singel's uh, 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 Blocked and Reported podcast. And there's maybe a two to three minute segment where she, sa she says, and I'm paraphrasing, um, because she was very sensitive appropriately for people misquoting her and mischaracterizing her, because she is sort of on thin ice to some degree, because the academic left hates this genetic stuff. And she's like, well, you know, this is the science and you kind of, you know, you're gonna be way better off accepting the world as the science shows it to be than just being in denial about this stuff. But her views have often been mischaracterized. Um, and so she, you know, as, as many of us who have had our views mischaracterized uh, feel, where you know, it pisses us off to have people say we said things or argue things we haven't said. But she makes a point in over about a two or three minute segment of saying she purposely positioned this as, uh, you know, and, 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 and flagged herself as on the left, as part of team left, um, uh, because she was she wanted the book to get a hearing and that if she didn't do that, people would have just turned it off. And now to me, and I think she's right about it. I think her analysis there is dead on. Uh, the book has been, I think, overall very well received. I think it deserves to have been well received, but that's not my, my point, is that she had very good intuitive antennas as to how the political biases in the field works. So you can't just come out and say, you know, intelligence really has a very large genetic component. If you do that, you're going to be denounced as a eugenicist and a Nazi. But if you say, look, you know, I, I, I'm an anti-racist. I think we need uh, policies for, you know, wealth, redistribu uh, wealth redistribution. There's too much inequality. Privilege, you know, there are too many privilege people who've come from privileged backgrounds have taken over the, uh, you know, everything that counts. And that's why you need to pay attention to my book. Well, then you can get some people to listen to you. And I think she's right about that. But that, but that tells you how academia works. Well, I mean, look, the progressive might say uh, academia works that way because 
uh, the, the right wing in many Western democracies has gone careening off the rails and what used to be your grandfather's uh, you know, right wing party of Eisenhower or, uh, or, or even George W. Bush or something is now a bunch of crazy people who deny climate science, who are skeptical of vaccines, who are, uh, you know, who don't believe in yeah. the institutions of democracy, who would just as soon steamroll an election as, uh, as look at it. Uh, it, you know, and so of course, yes, we're going to give more intellectual credibility to things that that seem like they're from the sane side of politics. Talk to us in fifty years when uh, when we've got Eisenhower back, and you know, and the left is all <laughs> are the ones trying to steal elections. So, so this is the thing for me, and this is, I realize this is both not really that effective and and very unsatisfying for most people. When you're talking about the science, for the most part, you should be taught, I believe, you should be, be talking about and should be able to talk about the science without having to worry about, you know, whose political axe is it sharpening? You, sh you shouldn't have to worry about that because if something is true, it's true because it's true. It's not true because you like or dislike Trump. It's true on grounds that establish whatever the thing is as actually being true. And we should, and I, I think I will just never, I will go to my grave dying on this hill. We should be able to have conversations about the evidence on its own merits without wonder, without worrying about, well, this is going to give, you know, sucker to people who are really evil. However, there is another great paper that is not yet published, but is po posted on a like one of the public archives um, uh, that examined a lot of the dynamic that your question asks about. Um, and so it, one of the things it shows, which is consistent with, with lots of other stuff, is that people exaggerate the beliefs of their ideological or you know, tribal opponents. So that's a problem in and of itself. So when people think, well, you know, if we just talk about this, it's going to give support to you know, the horrible people over there. They are thinking about horrible people over there. And there are horrible people over there. They're just not most of the people who are over there. But one of the reasons for that dynamic, as per this paper, and I think this is probably right, is that even though extremists are relatively small minorities on each side, people are very reluctant to call out or condemn or distance themselves from the extremists on their own side. And so there's probably two reasons for that. One is they're afraid of being ostracized themselves. I mean, as you saw that with all the, the Republicans who said, no, they're the election was completely reasonable, uh, you know, have all been like driven from the, the party frequently. So you see that on the on the right. And, you know, and on the left, you see, uh, you know, academics who say the left has gone too far, this cancel culture, this is like, yeah, this is bad, you know, get themselves into trouble. So, you know, you see this on both sides. So there's fear of the extremists on one side, but, but po probably even more powerful is fear of giving unintentional support to the other side. So if I say, you know, if I admit that the, that there was a, a, you know, a lot of uh, sort of damage and some deaths that resulted from a minority, a relatively small minority of Black Lives Matter protests, that can undercut support for Black Lives Matter. And, you know, we're gonna go back to 1950 and, you know, the country's gonna reinstitute Jim Crow. I, I, so people, because of that dynamic, people are unwilling to condemn, even when they're just kind of reasonable, you know, kind of moderate or reasonable on, on the left or sort of reasonable, reasoned on the right, and very uncomfortable with their extremists, they are very, they, they rarely say so. So what that does is seed, it seeds the rhetorical space to the extremists. So when people on the other side think, about their opponents, what they see disproportionately are the extremists. So you can't really blame them for exaggerating the other side's views because most of the sort of public discourse is taking place on the extremes.
As someone who spends uh, much of my career nitpicking my own side and pointing out the flaws in my own allies' <laughs> opinions, I do think that that just on a psychological level, that worldview is deeply mistaken because you know nothing gives greater credibility to your opponents than pretending that there are no problems on your own side, and nothing is likelier yeah, yeah. to build a bridge to your opponents and to make them more reasonable than by acknowledging right. your own side's flaws. Yeah. I, I just had David Frum on on my podcast, and uh, and w during the migrant crisis uh, after the you know during the Syrian refu Syrian war and the refugees pouring into Europe he was asked about far right parties in Europe and he was he made the point you know they're terrifying but if if the only people who talk about securing the borders are fascists then fascists are going to win elections so you know yeah. the left has to figure out a way to have have difficult conversations about the things that it hasn't necessarily gotten perfectly uh, perfectly right. So where does right. this where does this leave us all, <laughs> Lee? I mean, because <laughs> I'm interested. One thing that I always feel when I talk, you know, when we talk about things like this, is are we really just upset because, I guess, for want of a better word, cultural progress is moving faster than we'd like, like. You know, you talk about the norms around what you can and can't say, and let's set aside for a moment the question of just pure science, right? So let's say that if there's just a study that says something perfectly impartial and uh, about, you know, genetics or IQ or something like that, then we can tolerate those. But we all know that there are lots of spheres where the science is a little bit more culturally influenced. There are all kinds of interpretations in the 1950s or the 1920s. I mean, just, just open a newspaper from that era and you are, your eyes pop open at the casual racism and sexism that was understood just to be truth, right? Women aren't, you know, yeah. women aren't good at work. Uh, you know, black people are lazy Absolutely. or Mexicans are lazy or whatever it is. And people just thought, well, these are just, these are just impartial facts. I mean, these, these are not judgment facts. calls. These are, yeah. Now they're incredibly offensive things to say. Similarly, there are yeah. things that we say today that we regard as being true that will be regarded as horrendous in 50 years. Um, you know, is the quibbling about what you can and can't say just us being old curmudgeons? I, I, I would, I mean, my answer to the simple question is no. I don't think it's just us being old curmudgeons. I do think, look, I'm an academic and in acad academia deals with ideas. It also deals with evidence. And so the, the only way that I know of to vet the meaning and implication of ideas and evidence is to have robust, almost, you know, short of personally threatening people. I might have some other limitations, but almost unfettered ability to discuss the meaning of those ideas and that evidence. Um, and so, you know, I used to, I used to believe uh, that science um, trumps or is, is prior to issues of politics and justice, because once you bring politics and justice in, it risks skewing and distorting the science. And I, but I don't believe that anymore. Um, and the, the reason I don't believe it, very heavily influenced by Alice Drager. Alice Drager had his famous book from about 10 years ago, uh, Righteous, uh, the, the uh, Galileo, Galileo's Middle Finger. Yeah, she's great. She's completely great. Um, and, and she argued that the search for truth actually has to be based on justice. And what she means by that, or at least what I took away from my discussions with her on that, is that you need you know, bedrock protection of individual human rights, free speech, free association, free inquiry, academic freedom. Um, and because if you don't have those, you don't have the ability to truth seek it, when the truths when the truth lies in avenues that some groups for political reasons consider forbidden you end up with forbidden truths and so so that's because of that 
in that sense, the search for truth, you know, of which science is one, you know, one avenue. It's not the only way to search for truth, but, but you know, pres presumably most scientists think that's what they're doing. Um, but that has to be built on that sort of bedrock protection of, of free speech, free inquiry, open inquiry, and academic freedom. Because if it's not, you, you can't pursue the truth. You, you can pursue the truth if it fits the, you know, the dominant ideological agendas. But if it doesn't, which, if it doesn't, then you're at risk of all sorts of personal consequences. Yes, and what, what kind of a truth it. is that? That's not a truth worth pursuing if it has to be hemmed in by yeah, some Stalinist, yeah. <laughs> some preset Stalinist doctrine. <laughs> right, yeah. um, I yeah. wonder, I wonder Lee, if this then brings us back to the conversation uh, you know, earlier about denunciation versus criticism, that, that maybe what's unique about this moment that isn't just uh, old curmudgeons uh, sitting on their porch railing at, uh, <laughs> at the kids these days uh, having different mores than they do, Maybe what's different is that shift from criticizing ideas to denouncing people who dare to speak those ideas or, you know, criticizing racial slurs to denouncing people who merely refer to the existence of those racial slurs, even if they never use them in anger. The, the, the targeting of individuals yeah. is, is, is new, perhaps. And maybe the cowardice, maybe the, as you said earlier, the intensity of the mob is new and thus the cowardice of the people in positions of power to fire uh, people who explore unpopular ideas is, is new. I don't know. I, I, do, th I do think it's, it's new. What's, what's unclear is whether it's a wave that will receive, recede, not recede, well, that'll calm down and back, and back off, and that you know, society sometimes ebbs and flows in these ways. Um, or it's the new normal. And I think it's just too early to tell whether it's the new normal. I am concerned, I don't know that I'm right, but I am concerned that enough young people, you know, sort of teenagers through like graduate students are being socialized into a world where this is the new normal. This is like what you do. When somebody holds a belief that you oppose, uh, whether it's you know viscerally or any other way, um, what you do is denounce them. That, that's what you do. Um, and if that is the case, then that's a very dangerous development, I think. On the other hand, it, it may be that there are enough people sort of sick of this and going, you know, and that it's going to eventually, you know, the mobs will be rebuffed and ignored, and you know, and that may happen. I hope something like that happens. I don't see it happening anytime soon. I, you know, my, the, the perfect example for this is Dorian Abbott. So Dorian Abbott's a geophysicist at Uni University of Chicago who was denounced for opposing diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Now, I, I, you know, diverse DEI type programs, as far as I can tell, overlap about 80, 90% with affirmative action. Like they're more or less synonyms. They're not completely synonyms, but they're very synonymous, if not identical, um, at least how they're being implemented. Um, and California in November 2020, which is one of the most left states in the United States, and which is majority minority, that is, the white people are in a majority. There is no racial ethnic majority in California anymore. That state voted down affirmative action. That is, you know, whatever, 10, 15 years ago, it voted to ban affirmative action in hiring, remember Lawrence and admissions also. Um, and they brought it up again in this last election and it lost again. So when the most left or one of the most left states in the country votes against affirmative action, debating the appropriateness and worthwhile and merit of diversity, equity, and inclusion programs seems like this is like a conversation we should be having rather than threatening somebody with punishment or, or ostracism. You know, so, so that, that captures, that cap, well, so he, he's an interesting story because the, the, it, it actually happened to him twice, once at University of Chicago uh, where he teaches. Um, and there was a mob, there was a, mob, a sort of grad student, uh, you know, initiated mob, eventually brought some faculty and maybe some alumni into it. 
Um, but University of Chicago is generally regarded as not being one of the institutions that's super woke, right? As being one of the holdouts the, well, of... sort of. So Chicago has this statement, you know, the Chicago Academic Freedom Statement that's, you know, uh, um, just a resounding affirmation of academic freedom. But that doesn't mean the faculty are not heavily woke, right? Those are two different things. There's like the, the institutional policy versus the faculty. Or the, in this case, it was the grad students. But the resolution was, you know, he was in all sorts of hot water. Eventually, one of the editors at Quillette returning, it wasn't Claire, but it was one of the people under Claire, organized a counter petition in support of Abbott. And within a week had like 8,000 signatures saying, this guy should be allowed, but this is ridiculous. And then a day or two after they submitted it, the president of Chicago came out with this, you know, this, 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 again, sort of resounding affirmation of academic freedom. Didn't mention Abbott, didn't mention the, the physics department, or just we're committed to academic freedom, and then it all died down. But then a few months later, he was invited to give this very prestigious talk at MIT. And a mob at MIT formed because in, in, in the interim, he had published like an op-ed in Newsweek opposing DEI programs. So this triggered another mob who denounced him, called for him to be disinvited, and the, the powers that be caved. And he was disinvited. And, went, and to you know, clarify, his covered. transgression here, just for people who aren't too in the weeds about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means and how affirmative action is implemented in American colleges or not, like what is the substance of what he's saying that people found so objectionable? Well, so the, the proponents would argue that they are designed to provide representation to groups that are previously underrepresented in the academy. Right, so take things like race and, race and sexuality and yeah, ethnic background right. into account and right. religion maybe right. when you're, when you're right. hiring that's right. people or letting students in. That's right, that's right. And he's basically that's saying right. that that shouldn't happen. So it's less about, uh, his, his yeah. quibble is less with these sort of uh, like diversity classes that, and training where you might have to go and learn about how to be welcoming and inclusive in the workplace to people from different backgrounds and more about who gets a leg up? Yeah, I think it's mostly about, I mean, he has some alternative in one of the essays, I think it was two essays, that, that you know, basically argues for merit-based, you know, decisions. Um, and, you know, he, he also comes out very strongly against bias and taking action against discrimination and you want to hire the best people, but you don't, you know, he would argue that you don't engage, I mean, I don't know if he ever uses the term reverse discrimination, but the way you overcome bias is by being unbiased, by evaluating people based on their accomplishments, not by, by uh, uh, purposely taking whether it's race or sex or anything else into account. That would be his argument. And there's an, you know, my only point is there is an argument to be had there. This is like, you know, uh, it, it's a fairly mainstream American view. There's a slew of um, Pew surveys that ask people whether they support affirmative action in college admissions and in hiring. And vast majorities of Americans, including uh, Black respondents and Latino respondents, huge majorities oppose affirmative action. So that this is a forbidden position in academia is just ridiculous. It's just, you know, he may be right or wrong. And again, I'm not sure I, I, I'm not evaluating his position on the merits. I, that's not what I'm doing right now. What I am, all I'm saying is that it is a position that, you know, sh should be able to be debated in academia. And if it can't be debated, you know, when people get sanctioned, by, in this case, being disinvited, by having to fight off a mob. You know, even though nothing actually happened to him in Chicago, the whole experience of having to fight off a mob is a miserable experience. So if there's anyone else at Chicago who might have been considering contesting the way in which Chicago is doing DEI, they have probably learned from Abbott's experience, you know what, maybe I just better keep my mouth shut. So what I'm hearing you say is that the, the center of gravity of people who work in academia has has drifted off to the left and with it that has dragged the, uh, what are they, what do you call the, uh, the sort of envelope of acceptable ideas? There's some jargon. The there. Overton window. The Overton yeah, yeah. window. Yeah, the Overton, so the yeah. Overton window of, of ideas that are regarded as being acceptable in polite company has therefore yeah. shifted, which means that 
the whole conversation at university humanities departments has 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 diverged from what, as you say, a majority of Black Americans and uh, Latino Americans think is a normal normal discourse and normal yeah. opinions to have. So, how could a student who's listening to this or watching this, or someone who is, you know, not in a position of power, but is sort of tangentially in the orbit of these conversations and of this culture, what what would your advice to them be, and how can they make themselves useful? <laughs> uh, boy, that that is a uh, that's a wickedly good question. It's it you know. It really that so varies from person to person and position, you know, position to position. You know, for for a young person who doesn't have, you know, a lot of power or status, you know, you know, whatever, an 18 year old or 19 year old, early in college, you're you're happy to just get through college and get your grades. Just, you know, I, I would avoid the mobs. Just uh, avoid the mobs. Just. You know, if, when you see a mob forming, don't assume that they're right. Don't assume you know that, you know, even your, your friends are saying things that are actually true. There are so many cases where people have been denounced and then the truth has turned out to be way, way more nuanced and complex or even wrong than when the denunciation started. And it's just a terrible way to conduct a society, even if they're right. So just if if that's your position, you know, just don't just don't do that. Just just don't do that. That's so. If you, that's if you're in that kind of position. If you're in a higher status position, it, it's sort of the mirror image of that. Resist the mob. You know, I mean, if a person did something that before the mob existed, that you would fire them for, and you found out about it because of the mob. Well, that might be different, it, you know, like if, if you had an a priori standard that if a person crosses line X, you know, your job is at risk, well, then it doesn't matter that there's a mob. It's, it's, it's that the person crossed X. But if you don't have that, you know, if you don't have standards of professional conduct and you just have a mob calling for somebody's head, like just, just like tell the mob to go fly a kite. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the best examples of this is, is, is David Shores who's now kind of a pretty influential voice on the left. Um, he, I mean, he's quite bluntly a Democratic Party activist. I think he is self-described as, as sort of a socialist or a Democratic socialist. So he's pretty far left. His Twitter account self-describes as, I try to elect Democrats. <laughs> so, and he was fired, you know, this was summer of 2022 in the heat of the social justice Black Lives Matter protests. Of 2021, oh, 20, 2020. What, 2020, yeah, yeah. 2020. Um, he tweeted out an article, and you can't make this up, by a black sociologist at Princeton showing that peaceful protests win more people over to your side than do violent protests. His coworkers were triggered by this. That he was denounced. They claimed... He made them feel unsafe. And that is a quote. He made them feel unsafe. And he was fired. And it's like for tweeting a sociology article. So I mean, it, this is just I mean, craziness. we could have an entire other hour long conversation about safety, couldn't we? I mean, the idea that he's making <laughs> you unsafe because he's insufficiently right. supportive of uh, right. anti-racist protests that themselves have become right. violent, but right. you know the greater violence right. is the structural white supremacy of the United States, and because he is not expressing sufficient fealty to the idea of overturning the white supremacist structures of American governance and policing, right. he yes. is therefore directly making you unsafe, <laughs> like in this room right now. That's, that's right. right, that's right. The that's tenuousness right. Exactly of the right. tendrils of, of like connective yeah. tissue between you know a person's safety and an idea yeah. have become yeah. remarkably thin but um lee there's a lot to, there's a lot for us to noodle on there thank you so much for <laughs> articulating all that um it's lovely to have you on permission to think uh, in collaboration with uncomfortable conversations my my podcast uh, thank you thank you again it's wonderful thanks for having me it was a great conversation